Ladies and gentlemen, the recording I am about to present to you is the story of Lance Collins, a.k.a. John Todd. The name Collins was his Illuminati family name, and the Collins family is one of the 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati. The family name was later changed to the Todds to hide their family's secret past. From the age of five, he was trained to be a witch. At the age of 14, he was ordained as a priest in witchcraft, which gave him the title of a wizard. Later in life, he graduated to become a Grand Druid priest and was part of the Council of Thirteen, which is considered one of the highest tiers of the Illuminati. In the early 1970s, John Todd was saved by Jesus Christ and wanted to expose the Illuminati. He came into the Christian scene announcing that he was a former member of the Illuminati and involved in the occult. He made several appearances in audio tapes within the Christian community warning of the evil Illuminati plans. But they captured him and he was framed, imprisoned, and sent to a mental institution as an effort to discredit him. Several attempts were made on his life, and as of today, no one knows for sure what became of John Todd. The following audio by John Todd was recorded in the 1970s, and this is tape number one titled, The Occult. Here is his story. Before I start today, I'd like to leave a text with everybody. I try to leave it across the country. When I was saved, I knew absolutely nothing about the Bible except some basic teaching that I had picked up by accident when I was about 10 years old in a Nazarene church. When the people that I was being raised by that were in witchcraft found out that I had went to this church, they, as they say, blew their stack. And that was that for going and hearing anything about the Word of God. So everything I know about the Bible I've learned in the last five years. I had some very, very good teachers in San Antonio, a man named Jack Taylor, a Southern Baptist pastor. And when I told him, it was like two days after I was saved, uh, the things that I had come out of and was afraid of and so on, he gave me this scripture as kind of my battle cry text, whatever, throughout the walk in the ministry that I would have later. And I've left it with Christians because in a day and age when we see so much happening around us, we lose sight of who's behind what is happening around us. We lose sight that if it is good and positive, it's the Lord, and if it's evil and rebellious, it's the devil. And a lot of times we look at our teenage children and we think that they're the devil, and the teenage children look at the parents and think they're the devil. And we lose sight of really who our enemy is in this warfare that we're in. So I'd like to leave this with you. I'm sure many of you know it. And if you don't, I recommend that you mark it in your Bible and learn it by heart. Ephesians 6.12 For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I didn't bring my Amplified with me today. I was a little rushed as I was late. But uh, the Amplified gives a much clearer description of it. So many times we see political corruption and things going on, and these are a few things that I'm going to discuss today, but we lose sight of who's behind that political corruption. We looked at Nixon's era, we look at some of the things that Jimmy Carter's doing today, and we know they're not Christian deeds, we know that they have nothing to do with the Lord, but we kind of scratch them off to the man. We should scratch them off to the enemy, and then man is not the enemy. I came out of a family that um, was, you know, many of you, how many of you were raised Baptist? We'll start that way. All your life, that's what you were raised from the time you were a little child of Baptist. How many of you were raised in a Christian home? Okay, okay. Now, so in the Pentecostal churches, uh, which I <laughs> try to avoid as much as possible, uh, they have a term called homegrown Pentecostal. I guess homegrown Baptist would be just as fashionable. Well, I was a homegrown witch. From the time that I was five years old, I knew nothing but witchcraft. I would have known it sooner, but they didn't discuss it with me. They take you very, very young. And from the even before they start talking about the so-called positive aspects of witchcraft, they talk about the negative aspects of Christianity. So that I'm a, being a Christian is a miracle 
not because I wanted out of witchcraft, but that I would consider Christianity the only way out. Because they brainwash you from very early childhood that the Christian is the most evil being or creature in the universe. That he wants nothing more than to take the everyday witch out and shoot them, burn them, hang them, whatever he can do. And that they are the most hateful beings that ever existed on the same level as maybe Adolf Hitler. So this is what I was raised up to believe. And uh, my last name is Todd, but that was just changed about 60 years ago. Until then, our name was Collins. And the Collins family, my direct tree, was responsible, according to witchcraft history and a few history books that I can find also, with bringing witchcraft to the United States. So uh, when I was 14, and some of you might consider that a very early age, but it wasn't. It was kind of a late age for this. I was initiated into organized witchcraft. In other words, I was made what Brother Rasmussen is. I was made a pastor, a minister. I was ordained. In fact, a few years later, when I went to enlist in the service, I didn't have to go because I was draft exempt because I was the ordained minister of a legal recognized church. So, uh, 4D status for a few people who know what that is. I'm sure Brother Rasmussen does. Ordained ministers are exempt. And uh, I enlisted and went through the service until uh, I got into a little shooting incident in uh, uh, Germany after I'd come back from Vietnam. I'd re-enlisted and went to Germany. And uh, I was getting ready to be court-martialed. In fact, I had everything down pat. I was as good as gone. Uh, we had entered a plea of guilty yeah, for a uh, deal of 35 years and then parole, and they wouldn't even consider it. An officer had been killed in the situation, and I was more or less just waiting to be transferred to Leavenworth to serve the time when uh, you know, Witchcraft Church, which I thought was just a little group of people that I belonged to, sent a political member of that church, a state senator, two of them, a state senator, a uh, U.S. senator, and a representative over to Germany and they took hold of the situation and 24 hours later I was a civilian in the United States with all my time, rank, and an honorable discharge and my court martial records didn't exist anymore. And all of a sudden I realized I wasn't in something that just lit candles and incense and said magic words once in a while and stuck pins and dolls. There was a little more to it than just a religion. And uh, I left New Jersey and went home to Columbus and I asked my real mother, I have two mothers, I have a foster mother and a real mother, I asked my real mother what I was to do, and she said, here's an envelope of $2,000 and a one-way ticket to New York City. You get there on the next plane, and I'll tell them you're coming. She didn't tell me who she was going to tell if it was coming or anything. But I flew to New York City, and I spent six months learning all new witchcraft. Till then, I had been taught what most of the teenagers learn, and I want to tell the teenagers something here real quick. I'm sure most of you probably go to the school here, but if you were in a regular school, you would meet which is running all over the place. We hear this across the country. Almost every high school has it, especially in California. And they tell the young people lies. They tell them it's ESP. They tell them it's psychic power. They tell them it's spirits of the dead. They tell them everything but what it is. And I was supposed to be a high priest leading a church of, uh, that had 13 ministers to it, plus a couple hundred people in this congregation. And I believe this. And then all of a sudden, for six months, this man, Dr. Buckland, unraveled everything and told me there was a one God where before we believed there was four. There was one, and his name was Lucifer. And he was very quickly to tell me that wasn't Satan. He didn't want me to get any ideas that Christians could be telling me the truth. I should have thought then that if he had lied, they had lied to me for almost uh, 18 years, they were probably lying to me now. And But I went ahead and believed it, and for six months I took lessons in witchcraft that I didn't even know that things could happen that had happened. And then I was transferred to Los Angeles, good old LA, can't seem to get away from it. And for six months, my foster mother taught me something that your pastor is very familiar with, the political situation of the occult. And all of a sudden I realized that witchcraft wasn't just spell casting, it had a purpose in mind. And that's when I started getting a little afraid because when I was 10, as I said, I learned a little about the Bible. It just happened to be all revelations that I learned. And all of a sudden, we were discussing a world ruler that would be personally guided by Lucifer that could gain control of the world supernaturally and take control of people's minds. 
course, they didn't say there was a defense against this. The way they spoke, everybody was affected. They didn't say anything about the blood of Jesus. But uh, we sat there, and for six months I learned the political structure and the history of witchcraft. And then I was taken to Colorado, and I was placed through an initiation into the sixth realm. And this initiation consisted of a blood sacrifice. And from then on, I was given a territory of 13 states. This didn't happen to be one of them. This belonged to my foster mother. But I was in charge of all the occult, political, and drug activity in 13 states. And this is where I was in 1972 when I met the Lord. Well, I, at first, for many years, said by accident, but I've come to realize there's no such thing as an accident when it comes to Jesus. He had everything perfectly planned out. But it was a combination of a personal witness to a coffee house, a Jack Chick Publications track, and the movie The Cross and the Switchblade. And a lot of things that, uh, uh, for instance, one Baptist church praying and fasting that I would get saved. They figured if I got saved, maybe the rest of the witches would follow in suit. It didn't exactly happen that way, but uh, it did put a dent in the situation. So that's uh, quickly, very quickly, my testimony. What I want to do today is, for the young people and the adults here, I'd like to throw this thing open to question and answer. Because some of you may have run across situations, some of you may have questions on how to deal with people that are in this. I want to leave one word with you. The only answer to witchcraft, the only way that anybody's ever succeeded in getting out has been through the blood of Christ. Everybody else who's ever tried to get out of witchcraft, and I want to leave this with you, witchcraft is real and supernatural. I remember the minister who witnessed to me said that until he found his daughter in it, he was always, and he was a Baptist pastor, was always raised to believe that witches were fables that flew around on broomsticks on Halloween night. And all of a sudden he woke up and found it was very real. And if you want to find out the power behind it and how it can be defeated, I suggest the 16th chapter of Acts. Paul handled it very nicely. And it's one thing that I can testify to all the teenagers considering the lies that you're born with witchcraft, which is the lie that they give you. When I was saved, and the pastors there at the Baptist church called the demons that were inside me out, I lost all that power of witchcraft. I never regretted it. If the power came from demons, I don't need the demons. So before you teenagers start fooling around with the astrology charts and the Ouija board, check out the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy and find out you'll pick up a demon from doing it. And you pick up one, you keep on going. My foster mother wrote a book and she said, doing one spell or practicing one seance in witchcraft is like jumping off of a tall milk, uh, mountain or a skyscraper. There's no turning back. It is the strongest addiction that I know. Dave Wilkerson said that he had seen people go through withdrawal from drugs many times, but seeing one witch go through withdrawal from the occult shattered his mind. And I've helped thousands of people through withdrawal from witchcraft and withdrawal from drugs. And once you've seen the withdrawal that a person goes through from being in witchcraft, you'll think that drugs is something you practice in kindergarten. It's that violent and that destructive without Christ especially. And what I started to say was, nobody has ever succeeded in getting away because they simply will kill you with a spell. Now, Brother Rasmussen knows from testimony from other people who have been around. They haven't been able to do this to me or anybody else that has ever gotten out. A few people have been killed physically that have gotten out that were Christians that got out of witchcraft. But, and they've tried this with me and my wife and so on, but they've never succeeded and we're still very, very much alive. But uh, we have to depend wholly upon Jesus to stay in that situation. Now, before any of the young people decide that witchcraft is a groovy thing, they will tell you you can get out anytime you want. But once you're in, there's a bounty on your head should you ever leave. And I don't care if you're 13 or 14 years old, the bounty starts at $10,000 and they send a professional. They don't send an everyday person. And if you're wondering why I'm still alive, it isn't easy. I've got the bullet holes in the buildings and the bombed out buildings and everything else to the record and I stand that Jesus kept us alive in every situation. You don't walk into a building as it blows up in your face and walk back out without a scratch on you unless the Lord is there to protect you. And this occult is very dangerous. Chick Publications did the Broken Cross which will be on sale back here today. The only track that I know of that has saved people out of witchcraft. And they did this book. And because of it, they moved to another building 
with bulletproof glass and bombproof walls. That's the situation. The artist draws his stories at home now in a dwelling that they don't know where he is rather than try and drive to work and be in danger. And uh, Jack, uh, his staff is always on him to be more careful because they're trying to drive him off the road and stuff. We try to get him to drive a Cadillac that might stand up a little, but he says the Lord can protect him in his Toyota as well as a Cadillac, so he keeps on driving the Toyota. But that's the situation. It is no joke. It is a serious situation. The occult gives up less people to conversion than any other thing. And it's not because they don't want out. They desperately want out. We went to Minneapolis to where they had a convention. We took 10,000 of the Broken Cross there to distribute free, and they were so afraid of this book coming, they canceled the convention. Rather than let it fall in the hands of the people who would be coming from across Europe and across the United States to attend. But people came into our meetings there that came anyway, and they listened, and when they were done, they asked my wife and myself and other ministers, if you can put us in a safe place of protection, we'll come out. They want out. They know that Christianity is the only way, but they're physically afraid to come out. You think the mafia has fear for those that have been watching The Godfather or something? It has no fear compared to the occult people coming after you. But, uh, and your questions now if you've got some. Yeah. Well, 12 years old girls are big, more or less. Uh, they've been known to get down to 10, but they usually start at 12 or 13 and go to 25. And they, for the people who like to hitchhike, this is how they pick them all up. And of course the police will just tell the parents the kids run away from school. They use them for sexual and for sacrifice, human sacrifice purposes. For those that are wondering if that is an accident, you're in LA County here, right? The L.A. County Sheriff's Department has a very secret undercover thing. I don't even know if you can find out if it exists, but I talked to them. It's called the Occult Squad. They told me in 73 that they found 35 bodies of girls in Los Angeles County that year, and I talked to them in December, that they knew to be human sacrifice, which they listed as rape cases to keep it from the public. The statistics that came in so far this year are close to 125, and the year's not even over. Now that girls that have been used for human sacrifice. And if you all notice, there's quite a few rape cases that happened around Halloween that are in the news right now. And from what we can find out, the circumstances that each death fits human sacrifice. But you'll never hear it, that that's the reason. We turned in four different people that were responsible in the area that I knew about to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and they arrested all four. They got convictions, and in every conviction, they listed it as rape killing and they knew better. Yes. Yes, it is. It's listed in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy as con uh, converting with necromancy or familiar spirits. It, uh, clairvoyancy, anything that is psychic is a counterfeit of God's power by the devil. And it was, okay, the woman who was giving fortunes in the 16th chapter of Acts, that was clairvoyancy. When Paul cast the demon out, she couldn't tell fortunes anymore. That settles it right there. Yeah. Superstition is a Christian form of witchcraft. Okay. Okay, she asked me if superstition was a form of witchcraft. It's a Christian form of witchcraft. Uh, one thing I want to throw at the young people real quick. If in the occult stores, they don't sell Ouija boards in most of them, in the serious ones. They call it a Christian instrument. They say Christians are the only ones stupid enough to use it. Witches know that the devil runs it. They know more than some of the Christians. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want an answer on that? <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you asked me about that. Yes, I do. Physical evidence. One, take the exorcism first. The rite that the Catholic Church uses for exorcism, they have changed a few words, just, I think, about six words, is the witchcraft rite of exorcism. It is 8,000 years old. The Catholic Church is not that old. Okay? Next. On the apparitions, it's the same thing as the Spiritualist Church of America or any of the witchcraft organizations. It's called auras. 
And if you'll notice, none of them are pure white. Now, coming out of the occult, I know the system of colors. And the principality, uh, there's seven of them. And all the demons under them go by the collar of their leader, their general. And the occult demon, Rija, appears as a blue snake or a blue mist. I've heard thousands of reports, including Jean Dixon, that her report, that her guides, her spirit guides, familiar spirits, are blue in nature when they communicate with her. And of course, the red is lust and so on. It's a long list. But the faint or aspiration, I want to get into this thing real quick. The Catholic Church's altar, except for the Atame or the Ninth, is the exact altar of witchcraft. And according to the reports I can get on the Nicene Council, most of the ministers at the Nicene Council that set that heresy up were from the Temple of Diana, which is witchcraft. So everything, the bell, the incense, the whole ritual, their holy water is a salt water mixture. This comes from witchcraft, which they do exorcism with. Everything that they do comes out of witchcraft, and they can't get around it. Yeah. Okay. Did everybody hear that question? Okay. He wants me to explain the Council of Thirteen. I'll explain what that is, if you're probably wondering. And uh, what their purpose or thrust is. Okay. All right. If you'll all, just give you a second, reach in your billfold. You can put it in the offering plate later. Reach in your billfold and take out a $1 bill real quick. We'll settle the whole thing. I'll let, let you ask your federal government later how this got on the $1 bill. Okay. On the back of the $1 bill, you'll see the crest with the pyramid in it. Now, Dr. Rasmussen has upstairs the whole crest. You only have the words left out of it on the block. But there are sections. His is a little behind time. There's a few new organizations. His dates back to the 1800s. But that pyramid in the Illuminati consists of three pyramids and a sphinx. But their crest is this crest. The Illuminati is the occult organization that we belong to. It means the light bearers. The witch is called Mariah, the conquering wind. But it's the capstone above. The eye is Lucifer. The triangle of the capstone is the tribunal of the Rothschild family, which is called the Holy Family. They lead the Illuminati. They are, would be Paul, Peter, for the Catholics, all the saints, and Mary and everybody rolled into one, and the Pope. They are the voice. The doctrine of the occult teaches that Lucifer comes and sets at their dining room table. When they see the table, they leave 13 chairs out, and the 13th one is for Lucifer to set in himself. They set him a plate and everything. Now, I've been there in the mansion, and I've seen this go on. And they, in turn, direct to the top block of that pyramid. And that top block is the Council of 13 of the Grand Druid Council, which I was a member of. Now, the Druid system of government is not that the politicians run everything. It is the same system that Rome had. The priest let whoever wants to rule the government, but the priest must rule the ruler. Now, I'll let that sink on you for a while. And I want to throw this in. We'll cause a lot of controversy, I'm sure, but it's a fact. Since the time of World War Wilson, including him, there has never been a president of the United States that was not an Illuminati, that did not belong. Now, that will shatter a few people's ideas about a Christian president right now, but it's a fact anyway. And the Grand Druids, although they are just every, supposedly everyday people like me, you look at me now, I'm, I'm this way, I was a different way when I was in witchcraft. And part of my authority was whatever governors, senators, or political people were in my area took direct political orders from me, which I in turn did not think of, but simply translated to them from the orders that we got from London, from the Rothschild family. Now that's the Council of 13. The thrust is that when I left in 72, they had a chart that said in eight years, eight years, they would have the whole world. And from remembering that chart, I haven't seen one thing through the news media not happen on schedule according to that chart. I would say that that's about right.
I would say the word today would be Maranatha, that he's coming real quick, because theirs is coming real quick. They have it. It's not that far away. Okay. Yeah. It'd be easier to give you the names who aren't. About 99%. Okay. The man who pulled me out of jail became an attorney general under Ford. William Saxby. Well, that gives you two names to start with. The best way is to find out who belongs to the CFR or who belongs to the CFR. Yeah. Not the way it's been written. Uh, it's a little ridiculous. I know I'm going to step on a few people's toes who have read about the Illuminati, but uh, he asked me what part Zionism played in the Illuminati. Rothschild and a few people in the Illuminati were born Jews, but they're not Jews. You can get in the Word of God and find it. I'll give that a little bit. The system is this. With the same books that proclaim that the Illuminati is a Jewish organization, also proclaim that the Illuminati is a Luciferian organization. You can't have both. A true Jew believes in Yahweh. A Illuminati person, and I'm not a Jew, and I was a leader of the Illuminati, believes in Lucifer, the God of light, peace, love, blah, 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 and so on. It has nothing to do with the saints, because they might be a few Jews born, and they might have some ties with Zionism, bloodlines, but the organization itself has nothing to do with Jewism at all. It is totally 100% Druid occult, and that's its purpose. In fact, the reason that the Rothschilds even still resign in London is because England is considered to the witches the same as Palestine is considered to us. It is the Holy Land. You take pilgrimages there. You stop off and kiss the stones on the Rothschild mansion for luck and so on and so forth. If by some chance you happen to meet a Rothschild and he gives you a blessed sign or a blessed bee, then your whole life is set. It's that type of nature but it has nothing to do. There is an interesting thing, though, I'd like to throw in. A lot of witches do wear the thing called the Star of David. David was long dead before that star was ever drawn. His son drew it. And it's called the hexagram, and the word to curse or the hex comes from the hexagram. And when witches practice magic, they draw a five-pointed star to stand in, and they call demons up in the evil sign, what we call the Star of David. So before Christians start tying it around their neck, that's called the demon star, or the death star. And that's why it was drawn. For a few people that might be confused about the Solomon aspect, when he backslid, he became the most holiest person in the occult. Everything that we practice are based upon books that he wrote and pictures that he drew when he backslid. So, including that exorcism right you asked about, he wrote it. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll give you an Okay, she asked if they're behind witchcraft programs that are coming on. I'm going to give you two quick examples. For one, I was telling this across the country, the most disastrous film that has ever come out pro witchcraft, thousands of people that are Christians are going to go watch and are watching. I was told by a bunch of Christian people across the United States and every city I went to, you got to go see this movie. There's no sex. There's no violence. There's, you know, it's, it's just an old kind of, um, how would you put it, um, I can't think of the guy in the 30s that was a sequence in outer space movies, Flash Gordon type picture. So I went and watched it. It used words and beliefs that are the innermost beliefs in witchcraft. They're not even the ones spoken of in the open. And witches don't call it witchcraft. They call it the force. It's called Star Wars. And the whole thing is centered around two-thirds of the movie is based on the force. That you're stronger when you die, you're reincarnated, you receive guides from people who are dead. It's ESP. That you, that it's, see, the biggest line about witchcraft is that it's not bad. It's neither good nor bad. It's the person that's good or bad. And this movie emphasized that a lot. That witchcraft was okay as long as you were a good person. 
So, adults, before you let them go. And the other one I want to hit real quick is how many remember Bewitched? It's probably one of the main reasons that witchcraft grew it in Dark Shadows. They were, Bewitched was written by a witch. The belief of witchcraft is you're born a witch and that the mortals or everyday people who don't practice are dummies. You remember that in the thing? Well, they never got into, it was more of a comedy, they never got into witches' ceremonies or Sabbaths or anything like that. Last night, a person asked me to watch who had gotten to read the script of the new one, Tabitha. So I watched it. It had witchcraft all through it. Real witchcraft. Ceremonies, Halloween, everything. They're coming out stronger now. You better watch what your kids turn on the TV set. There hasn't been a witchcraft movie that had anything to do with Satan in the last five years that Satan didn't win openly in the picture. Tabitha, bewitched. Usually through, the, see, the Illuminati names don't used much anymore, except by everyday people who find out about it. Witches don't use it. The organization doesn't use it. And each country has a... Uh, the Mariah is the occult part, and the political part has a name in each country. And the United States is called the Council of Foreign Relations. That's mainly how they got into it. They mainly got into it because you can't become a president. You may think you elect a president, but I'm here to tell you, you elect whoever they put up. And when I was saved in 72, I got on a television broadcast that went throughout southern Texas, New Mexico, and so on. And it, they still got the tape down. It was on a talk show called The Seven club in the morning and I had a minister from the church there with me Ed human and they asked me the political aspect that would be happening now this was the election of Nixon and McGovern at the time and I said a few things I don't want to really get into right now because we don't have the time but one of the things I said was that the last election that would happen the president the next one that was coming up the one that just happened the president that would be elected would be the last president elected in the United States that doesn't mean it'll be the last election it just means he'll be the last president and that when he was elected, he was so important to be elected that the person who would run against him would also be Illuminati. That they wouldn't allow anybody else to get the nomination from the other party. And that he would purposely do everything during his campaign, the other party, in this case Ford, to throw that election. And if you'll look back on it, I think you'll see things that he did that proved that lost many, many votes. And then he almost won anyway. I think it would have been disastrous if he had won to them, not to us. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, yeah. We have talked with Reagan's son and other people, and they have told us of violent threats, bribes, death threats, assassination attempts, and everything that never reached the news media that went on during the uh, nomination thing for the Republican Party. Yeah. It ain't easy. I've got a first grader that uh, went to school, and every day she came home, she said, Daddy, here it is, throw it in the trash can during the Halloween season. The goblins, the ghosts, the witches, the stuff they cut out. She understood. She says, oh, well, Thanksgiving and Christmas is coming up. She understood. Halloween had absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. Christians shouldn't even touch it with a 10-foot pole. It comes from the word shaman, uh, which means the day the dead come back and talk. It was invented by witches, capitalized on by the Catholics, but nothing in it has to do with Christians. Nothing. Who wants to celebrate a day that witches sacrificed thousands of people throughout the world on? Yes. White magic and black magic is a Catholic term. When they were burning people at the stake for being witches, they wanted to protect themselves that practiced it. So they invented the term white witchcraft or white magic and black magic. Witches, in their books, will tell you that it doesn't exist, as it was mentioned in Star Wars. And yet, when they're trying to convert a Christian, they will say they're a white witch and not a black witch. And yet they'll tell you, in their books, it doesn't exist. Which means they'll say anything to convert you. But uh, there is no such thing. The devil is evil. And you can't whitewash him or anything he does. You can call it ESP, but it's still witchcraft. 
Yeah. Hypnosis is with the devil. Plain and simple. Yeah. charismatic realm. Theirs is feeling and not word. I go into charismatic churches and speak, I know. And I want to tell you something. They can't understand why they have no young people. They can't understand why the young people are practicing witchcraft. It's because they've never been taught the word. They've been trying to give a form of discipline without love, strong discipline, no love to go with it, and no word, just emotion. And then they wonder why somebody is saved three months and then in the world three months later. A good example of this is Melody Land. It's got to probably be one of the worst churches in Calvary Chapel in the United States. Because it gives absolutely, they have a whole Bible college. They teach nothing but emotion. In theory, they don't teach the word. Well, as long as you, well, one thing real quick here. Satanists believe in Satan. Witches do not. And there is a difference. Witches are taught that Satan and hell is a lie. I was saved for hours before I ever knew there was a devil. I concentrate on the scripture. I concentrate on the 16th chapter of Acts and Rome, I mean the Ephesians 6, 12, the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy. Please don't quote, oh, uh, we suffer a witch to die. Please don't quote that because they have to death. But uh, work on the love and work on the scripture. Parents, if you're letting to compromise with your young people, them having rock music in your home, which you as Christian parents own and are responsible to the Lord for, then you're wrong. And I recommend you go home right now and throw it in the trash can immediately. And this is the reason why. You see groups up on the television and on the, you hear them on the radio and in concert and stuff and, and you know, you don't see the behind thing. Now here's one fact. Zodiac Production. The leading Texas publication, it's changed its name now, but it was Zodiac Productions when I was with it. I was supposedly the owner of it. The occult owned it. And it was the leading source of concerts in Texas. Its office was in San Antonio. Because I was supposedly the owner, I met most of the groups in existence then. There are a few that have come out since then, but it's still the same type of thing. Almost all of them believe openly in the occult, in one way or the other. Most are into Satanism. Now, how many Christian young people remember from Billy Jack, One Tin Soldier, the song? A few of you? Okay. The group you heard on the radio called Original Cast. They always said it was done by the Original Cast. The name of the group that was the Original Cast is Coven. It was led by Tom Laughlin's daughter. Tom Laughlin played Billy Jack, his wife, his son, David, who produced it, and both his daughters are into Satanism. In fact, they produced the only eight-track out on a complete Satanist step-by-step -step ceremony done by COVID. And that's the group who did One Tin Soldier. And I've seen all of the movies except the new one that's coming out. And every one of the Billy Jack movies are anti-Christian, pro-occult. The trial of Billy Jack dealt with demons and had more ceremonies of witchcraft and Satanism in, in it than it had anything about a trial of Billy Jack. And it was constant step-by-step -step ceremonies. It was reincarnation. Familiar spirits entered his body in the first Billy Jack and spoke to him, if you remember. Over and over, it came through. Now, that's one group. Rolling Stones. Mick Jagger has told openly, over and over on television, I don't know where our Christian young people were when it was going on, that when he was in jail before the Stones was ever formed, he sold his soul to the devil. That's impossible, but he did it in it. He sold his soul to the devil to become the leading rock group in the nation, plus get out of prison. He is the leading rock group in the nation, in the world. He has wrote songs praising the devil. And I know the devil gave it to him because the devil always thinks on himself. And in one song that Jagger wrote, he said, it's not that I fool you who I am. Everybody knows who the devil is. It's the nature of my game that's confusing you. And this is why it is with Satan. See, we've got a little set of rules that Satan's supposed to obey, but he don't obey them. It's like the Illuminati. They own countries. They don't pick sides in a war. They cause a war and put both countries against each other, even though both countries belong to them. They don't have sides. They have a purpose. Satan has every religion except that which is under the blood of Jesus. That's where the confusion of the game is. 
We try to rationalize things good or bad, and we can't do that. We rationalize things Jesus or the devil. That's where you draw the line. But stagger over and over, and that goes with rock music too. Don't try to rationalize it good or bad. It's bad. Now, I want to give you an incident that will kind of sum it up. I did meet most of them. Most of them were in the occult, but most of them were on drugs. Now, I want to say something real quick here. How many remember a group called Bloodstone, or Blood Rock, I think it was? DOA, the song DOA. They did the song while they were on acid. They got the words. I talked with a guy. He said a demon. Well, he didn't call it a demon. He called it the spirit of this girl that he knew that had died in the car accident. It was a demon impersonating the girl. Appeared to him and gave him during this acid trip the notes, the words, and everything. They filed it with a copyright lawyer. The day after the copyright lawyer filed it, Another group came in that was well known at that time and filed the same song, note for note, word for word. And when I was in the occult, I thought it was interesting enough to check it up because I wrote for an occult newspaper and I put the story in the paper. They got it the same way, on an acid trip, the same night, from a demon in a, imitating a spirit of somebody they had known that had died. Most rock musicians get their music while on drugs or from spirit guides, which are demons. That's what the, your young people are buying and paying for. Now, I'll give you something supernatural you can file away if you don't want to receive it or take it home and, and get in the Word and see if it's possible. When witches write a book, they cast a spell over the book so it'll sell. And they order a demon to go into every copy that comes off the press. So when you own a book on witchcraft, you have a demon residing in your home free of charge. The musicians who do the music that are in witchcraft do the same thing to the record album, the same thing. So when you see that friendly little album spinning on your thing, ask yourself, was the musician a witch? Did he cast a spell over the album that the devil would have a pact in my home because I owned the record? There's more to it than records and books. And this morning, you remember, I gave the text and I meant to get into this then because it fit the text. Your warfare is not physical, it's spiritual. And every Christian should memorize Ephesians 6.12 and stand on it. Look beyond what you see with these and look and know that the devil has got, what, thousands and thousands of years of experience. And unless we think with the mind of Christ, he's going to walk all over us. And that's why you stay under the blood. A young man came up and asked me today, can a witch cast a spell on a Christian? He can cast it on any Christian that's not living the life. If you want to fence straddle, you're a wide open target for any witch in the world. If you want to stay under the blood and you want to walk the line and, and be within the word and within the spirit of God, and wear the full armor of God, then you're going to be fine. Well, I think all of us know what it means when we come to church and set in the service and then go out and live like the devil all week long and think we're immune to anything of the devil. If you're going to live in his territory, he's going to live in yours. And that includes the rock music. I go along on that question, but I cannot miss the rock music. The main reason that young people go into witchcraft today is through the music. As I've told people, Rock music didn't come out with Elvis Presley. It's thousands of years old. If you take it away, witches can't do witchcraft. They can't function without the music. It's a third of their power. You think about it. Well, many modern churches know who their source of power is anyway. Yeah. You would. You would. <laughs> All right. The question was, the question was this morning that I mentioned the chart that I had seen. This morning. Or I mentioned this morning. I had seen... And when I saw the chart, it was August the 1st, 1972, for those that want to write it down, and I was saved in Labor Day, just shortly before I was saved. It was one of the main reasons I got saved. I wanted out after I saw the chart. The chart was a complete timetable that gave the Illuminati complete world control minus China. I want to specify that. Minus China in eight years. The reason minus China, they plan on taking China completely out. It's too unruly to try and rule. It's plan on wiping it out. And so I'll let that settle with you for a minute. The Church of Scientology was formed by a witchcraft coven in California originally. That its leader came from England on express orders of the Rothschild. Uh, there are a few religions we can't prove physically belong to the organization, but we have seen funding go their way. Now, as I have done quite a few bit of investigation since I was saved because of facts I heard when I was in witchcraft, don't just look at obscene religions like Scientology, Jehovah Witness, Mormonism. Look at even Christian churches within Bible-believing denominations. There was a couple, quote, Jesus people, garbage churches, that began a few years ago in L.A., Costa Mesa, and so on. They had a few hundred kids. All of a sudden, 
the pastors move in the half a million dollar home, and the churches are taking their offerings out in armored cars. Now, where did they get the funds to buy a two million dollar building overnight? They were preaching gospel. Now they're preaching trash. One of them is responsible for the so-called Jesus rock that has ruined half of the good Christian young people today. Now I never have to speak against anything unless I go check it out. And I went down to Costa Mesa and I saw something that bordered witchcraft on their open concert night at Calvary Chapel on Saturday night. There were people shoving and digging on each other just to get a seat in that place. And they turned hundreds away. Nothing was mentioned about Jesus, and a homosexual was leading the service. And you had to have been blind not to see it. And it was a total acid rock type concert in the name of Jesus. Now that's the same group that puts out all your love song albums and, and all this stuff that people listen to. So I try to warn as I go along things that we have found out it's up to Christians. It's like Paul said, if you think meat is not a sin, eat it. And if you think it is, don't eat it. If you want to buy what I'm saying, I think your walk will get a little stronger if you want to... Keep on listening to stuff. I can look at Christians and tell how strong they are in the Lord and where they're walking with him by the type of music they're listening to. And then I, I'm this way. If I find something in my life that I don't want to give up, I'll usually give it up. Because, you know, it's, it's that simple. When you don't want to give something up, the devil's usually trying to get you to hang on to it. Do I subscribe to a Roberts being a member of Witchcraft? Or Roberts, if you'll check into it, used to, and this is fact, it's fact you can find in books. Before he ever considered laying hands on the sick, that they would recover, a Cherokee medium told him that he could do it. And he used to attend her seances regularly. Okay? What he is now, I can't say. I only know the fact of what he was. I was once a witch, so you know he could be a Christian. I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I know that he's gotten out of more of the Pentecostal charismatic and become more scriptural based on the Bible than on feeling now than he used to be. And I know many ministers that were once witchcraft ministers under the guise of Christians that had just changed mid-river and became Christians. But they, rather than ruin their ministry, they've never told anybody. And there are a few that I know that used to be on the payroll of the Illuminati that are now Christians. So I don't know. Yes? No. All right, the question is, can a demon possess a Christian? No. Can a demon influence a Christian? Yes. Yes. I was saved, born again, two weeks, and trying desperately to make it. Before the other ministers in the Baptist church I was at decided that I was never going to make it unless they got what I had invited in me in witchcraft out of me because it was still there. It had lost control. Before, I couldn't do anything it didn't want me to do. But from the time I accepted Jesus, that broke the control. But it had influence in my life still that had to go. And for those that have been on drugs and those that have been in the occult, and there have been a few that come up and told me so, They'll, they'll probably bear witness that they have. This is what I was talking about earlier, the, the withdrawal. A lot of it went when I went through the occult withdrawal, which is worse than drug withdrawal. It is tremendously worse. A person that has come out of witchcraft that has been in it strongly and demon worship in particular can be one minute just sitting there really talking about the Lord, holding scripture, and the next minute knocking anybody down between you and the door. I've seen them claw off the wall with their bare fingers trying to claw out of the room they were going to withdraw in just to get out because the force on the other side was calling them back to them, the other witches. This is what they do first. Then if they can't get you back, then they try and kill you supernaturally. That don't work on a Christian, so they try and... It's really funny. Most witches had given up the aspect of trying to kill me supernaturally shortly after I was saved. This is how they tried first. I went to Minneapolis, and they hadn't got the message, evidently. So they started casting spells, which didn't work at all, but you could fill them in the air. And then, when they found out that didn't work after a week, then they took the boat, but they hadn't gotten the message yet. But they're slowly learning they can't cast on a Christian if the Christian is sold out. I'm sure a few people know there's those that have Jesus as Savior and then there's those that have Jesus as Lord. Yes. My wife was saved in a meeting a few years after I was saved, and her title was Lady Diana. That was her witch name. She was the state high priestess. She ruled everything in the state of Ohio that was in witchcraft. She was also the witch queen of one of the denomination or brotherhood, the Watcher. On a scale in this country of maybe 1 to 25, she was probably the 10 most powerful witch in the United States for my salvation. And she has close to $50,000 on her head because she's come out, not because she's married me, just because she got saved. And we took her into a rehabilitation ministry, and then later we started dating and were married and so on.
but uh, she does a fine ministry. Right now, she's just about ready to deliver a baby. She thinks she might even have it today. So uh, she's not exactly ministering lately. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, let me take about five minutes here. The question is, is human sacrifice practice in which path? I have to be kind of careful since a police officer is present here without incriminating myself or something. But uh, The Broken Cross was written by myself and Jack Chick. When it was reproduced, the guy who was doing the wording in the book, you know, writing our story form out, changed a few words. He thought were stronger. He changed the word witchcraft to Satanism a couple places, and he changed the word Lucifer to Satan. That messed up the book. We didn't catch it until just recently, all these years. I've been reading just kind of skipping over it because it means the same thing in my mind. But when a witch who doesn't believe in Satan reads it, it blows the whole thing. Since it wasn't written on Satanism, it was written on witchcraft. So... The next printing coming out, they're changing the words back the way they're supposed to be. Satanism practices a form of, of sacrifice in some groups. Witches practice it more. To the everyday witch, that's a lie, I'm telling you. There's a few witches here in the congregation tonight that I know. Yeah. But there's a few here also that are in the human sacrifice, and they know I'm not lying. And when you get up into a higher level, fourth, fifth, or sixth, you find out that the power rests with blood sacrifice. You become what is called a human chalice. In other words, you are proving to Satan through the blood and the death of this person that you are sold totally out to him, although they don't believe in Satan. You're proving it to Lucifer. I always, the things that always puzzled me was if we were worshiping a God of love, peace, and joy, why were we killing somebody to worship him? It was one of the things I could never understand. But uh, this is the, the thing that goes on. One of the books most interesting that proves it, I'm saying this for witches that are present, not the Christians, leave it alone, is the Aleister Crowley Library where he was involved in human sacrifice and he was a master magician or witch or wizard, whatever term they want to use. So it does go on. And in fact, to become a six-level witch, you must perform it. It's just like when they, they tell, now this is for the women, not the men, when they tell the young girls getting into witchcraft that homosexuality has nothing to do with witchcraft. In order to become a high priest, the girl must be bisexual. She must perform a bisexual act. So see, every level you go to, they tell you a different story. And they tell you that people below aren't ready to receive it yet. And so every step you go up the ladder, everything you've been told before is a lie, and all of a sudden you learn new truth. The only type of witches that are kind of ignorant, and there are a couple of them here today, are the self-proclaimed witches. The ones who are practicing outside the organization on their own. And they think they know it all, she says. They'll find out one of these days when an enforcer comes from the organization and tells them you either join or you die. Then they'll find out it's not a game anymore. See, it's just like the mafia. You don't function on anything else. Let's take a few minutes back here in the blue shirt. What? Oh, I think it started in the garden. Since the main lie of witchcraft is God's self, and that's the lie that Lucifer or Satan gave Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, we can find it starting then uh, before the flood and going on through. Of course, uh, we had... Um, uh, Neiman, who hunted the souls of man, who sacrificed babies. Uh, I want to say one thing since you brought that up. Astrology comes from Babylon. The high priests of Babylon were called the Chaldeans, and they invented astrology. It is the cornerstone of witchcraft spell casting. If you take astrology away, witches can't cast spells. And the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy lists the death sentences that the Jews used to have on them for doing things and following the stars as one. So when somebody comes up and says, what sign are you, say the sign of the cross. Now I'm going to tell you something. In witchcraft, they have a belief that says you are what you are when you were born. You can never change, okay? There is no miracle salvation in their doctrine. I was a Taurus, and I had all the personality of a Taurus until I was saved. I have none of that personality now. You do change through the blood. If you want to believe that you are born a certain way and have a certain personality, fine. Take the blood of Jesus Christ, and you'll find out if you walk in the Bible, you'll all have one personality, that of Jesus. And his wasn't any particular sign. So um, I get Christians who come up all the time and want me to, to give them permission, you know, by saying, yeah, astrology's all right, don't worry about it. And I, it amazes me. They'll ask me, and they'll say no, and they'll ask me again, they'll say no, and they'll ask me again, and they'll say no, and they keep on asking me, and I'm still saying no, you know. And they go through it about eight times. I guess they think they'll break me down eventually. The answer is no. Astrology belongs to the devil. God doesn't use the stars. They say, what about the wise men? The wise men weren't astrologers. They were astronomers. A new star appeared. Not a new fortune under the stars. 
But if you take the times and the seasons and astrology away from a witch, they can't cast spells because spells are based upon astrology. So if you want to read Gene Dixon or Louise Huebner in the newspaper, that's your choice. You're the one that's going to have to face our Lord for it. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, for the tape recorders bit and a few people who didn't hear it. It's a form of fortune telling, okay? I know the leader of the occult in the United States, Gavin Frost, reads your fingernail. And I asked him one time when I was in the occult, I said, Gavin, there is no occult teaching on fingernail. He says, John, now you know, or he said, Lance, you know when you lay the cards down, and this is my way of answering, when they lay the fortune card down, they don't read the card, they read pictures and messages that come to them. That's why it's individual. It's not how the cards fall. The cards are just uh, a prop in the play. They still get psychic messages. It's all a form of psychic reading that they're still going to give you the definition from. He says, I just touched the finger now because the people accept something physical before they accept something supernatural. It's just like uh, witchcraft has grown so much recently because now all of a sudden it's uh, telekinesis and EFT and, and clinical parapsychology names for the devil's power. So it's more acceptable now. It's still the same thing. Yes. How can you detect the witch? Mm. Supernaturally or physically? Well, I'll tell you this. The witch will detect you if you're a Christian before you'll detect them. Okay? But um, jewelry-wise, usually the five-pointed star in a circle or the six-pointed star or um, the cross with a serpent entwined about it, you see one of those get away from it. That's their little suicide group. That's the one Manson belongs to, the process. Um, the ghost head, uh, triangles. It's, it's, I have, that's one of the reasons I had one in the black world, but we didn't get it set up in time. Uh, it's jewelry. They're, in certain areas, it depends upon the leader. They make the females dress in certain sensuous ways, but out here they don't. Um, makeup on the eyes, particularly in a female. When we get a witch saved out of witchcraft, they can't touch makeup for almost three months because they're taught to use makeup for witchcraft, which is what it was invented for, and they can't touch it for three months because the spirits that came out of them try to get back into them through the makeup. And we've lost many people through it. Later, if they grow and strong in the Lord, if they want to use a little makeup, they can, but they never go back to using it the way they were taught to use it in witchcraft. Uh, supernaturally, you can detect it through the eye. Many people, after being around witches for a while, start to see the difference between witches' eyes and everybody else's eyes. It's just simply the demons that were in them, okay, and the wisdom that came with it. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad somebody brought that up. The attorney general we have now was, before Carter appointed him, and by the way, was also in charge of Carter's campaign, the man who formed the National Lobby for Gun Control. He has spent over $5 million of his own finance to ban guns in the country. Now, we're told two things on the gun control. Then I will tell you what the new gun control act is that's been written that we just got our eyes on to recently. The gun control lobbyists say, quote, we only want to ban handguns. Well, they proved that's a lie when they just tried to ban all guns and gave the National Guard the right to go in and confiscate them in, in uh, um, yeah, Massachusetts. So that was defeated. And the other was the law-abiding citizens can own it. Right now, you can own a handgun in Frisco if you get permission, right? But they're not giving permission to anybody. Now, the new Gun Control Act, and the reason I'm on this about guns is their timetable will never accept, will never work if individuals are allowed to buy guns. This is one of their main objectives to get rid of. If you'll notice, England's a prime example of it, and that was the Rothschild's doing. The new Gun Control Act is you're only allowed to own a single shot or a double barrel or over and under shotgun, something that can't contain more than two shells at a time, shotguns only, and all ammunition and all guns must be stored at the police station or armory at dusk and can be picked up at dawn, and all fired spent cases must be returned and be counted so that you won't be holding any ammunition back. That's Carter's new gun act. He expects to have it a law in two years. The timetable says expect to lose your guns in six to nine months in California. I have a Christian friend that is a special investigator that I just talked to recently on the phone two days ago for the Attorney General's office in California. Brown called secretly last week a special secret grand jury to consider total gun ban and confiscation in California, meaning they can come to your home without search warrant and confiscate any guns if you're on record for it. He expects to have it passed, expects to call grand jury, 
Every one of the people on it, except the special investigator that digging up information, is every time he brought in information pro gun, they threw it out. Wouldn't even bring it to the grand jury. Once the grand jury says, yeah, we got a lot of bad stuff here, they're going to take it to the legislature in six to nine months. Forget your handgun. Yeah. Quickly, how much time do we have yet? Five minutes? Okay. I will. Have you ever heard of the Aquarian Bible? I'll take first, okay? With, uh, I own the cult stores. My wife owned the cult stores. In fact, my wife, when she was saved, owned the biggest occult store in the United States, the witches told her. And it sold it. It is a Bible, suppose a book, supposedly containing the missing first 12 years of Christ's life, and that he was not the Son of God, but he was taught in Egypt and India the practices of witchcraft, including raising himself from the dead. That's the Aquarian Gospel, that he was a master witch. The next is that I said that Mormons aren't Christian. Christian means follower of Christ. Christ said he is the only way and you must be born again. Mormons do not believe in a born again experience. No, they do not. Have I been a Mormon? I have talked to dozens of Mormons. They do not believe in a born again. They do not believe in, okay, their Bible is completely contrary to our Bible. I'm not going to sit here and debate Mormonism, but they do not believe in a born again experience. Not the way that the Bible foretells a born again experience through repentance and through the blood of Jesus Christ, okay? They don't believe in a second coming. They don't believe it in a lot of things that it contains. They don't. I'm not going to argue. No, they don't. I talked with their pastors. I know. I went. I talked to the Mason, I, their elder. I talked with the, their, I quote, pastor for the other people's benefit, in charge of the temple in Mesa. And that, if you'll know anything about it, is one of their largest. And this is stuff that he asked me because I wanted to know. And this is the fact that he told me. I told him what we believe, and I said, what do you believe? And it didn't match up. What they said that tried to make it sound that way. But then I pulled a direct scripture and said, do you believe it this way? And they said, no. 